it's important to be yourself. It's important to stay authentic. It really is. Otherwise, you're just one of the other white sheep in the herd of a lot of white sheep. And uh, yeah, that's it. So I actually, I tried to adapt. I did all the acting. I did all the very diplomatic. Hey, yeah, <laughs> so nice to meet you. Da, da, da. But in the end, I'm like, no, no, it's not me. I don't want to be an actress. I want to be a dancer. And yes, I am. <laughs> Hey, all right, so I am now on the line with a Miss Maria Maluka. Who, Hello, guys. Uh, you are a Simba Kizamba dancer, instructor, as well as an organizer. Uh, you have, you are part of a dance school in Hamburg, Germany called A Bailard Hamburg. You are also the organizer of multiple festivals in Hamburg, Germany, including the Jenga Festival Hamburg, which I heard, which I've heard great things about. Um, you're also one of the founding members of the Avengers Dance Group. Is that all correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And actually, in the past uh, nine years, I was named Tudu Kizomba. Okay, okay, sure enough, sure enough. Uh, how are you doing today, Miss Maria? Uh, doing fine. A bit stuck without dance during COVID. Okay. <laughs> How's it going over there? Uh, same thing. Everything is shut down. Yeah, no, that's how it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. They've actually started up some salsa classes around here. Oh, nice. Okay. It's How's limited. that going? Only with fixed partner, probably, huh? Exactly. I go with my girl. Um kind of a small class but it's something to get us out the house yeah that's nice yeah, yeah here nothing is allowed nothing zero <laughs> especially yeah. when he's with so such close contact i understand that yeah yeah uh, apparently it doesn't matter what you do any kind of sportive action where you breathe a little bit more than you would do <laughs> just speaking that's all uh, shut down yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's COVID. Um, on to a, let's say a brighter note. Um, were you born in Hamburg, Germany? No, actually I was born in Cologne. That's in the middle of Germany. And then I moved to Hamburg like uh, 13 years ago. Okay, okay. So tell me this then. Um, I was actually born in Germany, but I left when I was a baby. So oh, I was really? Yeah, I was born in Munich. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would love to hear from you, though. Tell me about your childhood growing up in Cologne. What was that like for you? Uh, it was fun. <laughs> um, no, actually, I, my childhood memories are very I, nice. I, have, um, I think I had a nice childhood with very little money. We were always living off um, welfare because um, my dad disappeared, kind of like, and he didn't take care financially of the three kids he had. So, um, yeah, I grew up uh, with my two brothers and my single mom, and um, we tried to make the best of it. We got to travel a lot by car, always saved our money during the whole year, and then in the summer we spent it all on that one holiday, and um, yeah, what happened? I went to, to uh, do you know, uh, Rudolf Steiner schools, it's like some anthroposophic uh, private schooling system. Uh, very creative. Um, they they um, push you a lot to become a, a creative individual, um, really yourself. Um, and uh, I started dancing also as uh, with six. Uh, and I had to convince my mom to like she was going to a sports center around the corner. I was like, Mom, I want to dance. She's like, No, no money for that. When I want to dance, and we went on like this. At some point, the dance school owner knew about it. <laughs> And they were like, okay, we're going to sponsor you. And so I started dancing also. It was very nice. Um, yeah, but it was a, a lot of good times. Um, tough, but good. Uh, and then after high school, I decided that I want to study in Hamburg. And that's how I ended up here in Hamburg. I'm curious. Um, you know, I really don't know too much about Germany. So I'm curious, is, is there a dancing culture in Germany? Is that a thing? Yeah, <laughs> difficult to say. Um, I would say uh, we have um, 
we have a formal dancing culture, which is all in the ballroom dances. Yeah, so you learn the disco fox, you learn the waltz, you learn the, you know, standard ballroom dances. But mostly just as a teenager, so you have something to dance when you graduate from high school. So that's not really a popular thing. It's a thing that you should do, but everybody's like, hey, so uncool, not nice, you know. So not many people get uh, into couple dancing. But what is uh, quite active is actually uh, the hip hop scene, I think. Hip hop and, and contemporary and classical dances are pre pretty much represented, yes. I'm curious. Tell me, tell me this. Um... How important was music growing up in your childhood? How important was that like in your household? Um, pretty important because um, um, somehow my parents were musicians. So my mom was a piano player. My dad was a bass player. Mm, my grandparents were singing and dancing and playing the accordion, I think. So it was always there. It was never like the first priority, but it was always like a constant presence. So I got to learn piano also. Um, and then music from all kinds of international background was entering my whole childhood. But um, yeah, it was always just subconsciously present. Let's say like this. It was never becoming like something very focused. So my focus was more on on dancing and um, live as a teenager I mean I don't know what happens then it's like everything but uh, uh, focusing on anything <laughs> particular <laughs> yeah. I, I definitely understand that so so you tell me um so you grow up you know wanting to dance you're able to get sponsored uh you say you graduate high school and then you go to Hamburg to is that for uh, college and that was for uh, studies. I became a pastry chef. A pastry chef? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yep. well, yeah, you got to tell me about that. Um, and uh, you think of pastries, you know what I'm saying, like a, like a sweet dish, right? Out of bread or, you know, yeast? I'm saying anything that has to do with cake, chocolate, sweets, um, baked goods, uh, bonbons, uh, whatever you want. Anything sweet. Okay, well, I gotta tell me this now. I gotta know about this. Um, you know what? What was what was that like? Learning to become a, a professional pastry chef. What was that like? Oh, that was very tough. <laughs> that was super tough. Uh, so in Germany, we have um, several possibilities to educate yourself after high school, or even like before you finish high school. Um, so we have something called Ausbildung. It's a kind of professional training that happens in school and in the company at the same time. And it lasts three years and you will have a, you have a proper degree after that, right? So you'd be, let's say a bachelor or whatever after that. Um, so several jobs that are very much focused in the crafts are doing this type of training. So for example, pastry chef, hairdresser, um, car mechanics, I don't know anything like very practical where you don't need a higher level of intellectual input right so you can do it in three years and if you have a higher degree from high school you do it in um two years so i um i i was like in between like do i go to university do i sit my ass down and study more or do i actually you know i was like i want to do something with my hands so i decided to become a pastry chef Issue is that becoming a pastry chef, it's a 40 plus week. Um, you get up at four in the morning, you, know, you work from five till two. And if it's uh, Easter or Christmas season, you work like 12 or 14 hours a day. Um, and you work at those odd times when nobody's awake, right? So <laughs> you have to go to bed at 8 p.m. But how are you going to do that? Because all your friends are requesting you to come out and you want to go I don't know go to a jam session you want to go to a dance you want to I don't know you want to get to know the city because what you have to think about I moved to Hamburg and I had no friends nothing no social circles and I was like ooh, hungry a new city you know I need to know it all yeah so I ended up uh, as a zombie <laughs> not sleeping enough <laughs> Um, going, yeah, <laughs> going, <laughs> walking on my bones, 
Um, but I love the content. It's just that the working times were super hard. Payment was absolutely shit, if I may say that. Um, and yeah, after two two years, I kind of made a extravagant exit of that study by breaking my foot and um, missing my exam. Um, then recovering like six months and then I, I decided, okay, I'm going to take up the exam again. So I did that. I finished it. I have my degree and everything. But it was also for me a sign to not continue working in that area because of the working times and uh, um, the payment, which was absolutely ridiculous, completely um, unfair. So I kind of left that part and then continued with other things that interested me. Mm, okay, that's something I don't really hear too much about. Um... Tell me this, though. I'm very curious to hear from you. Um, you know, I myself, I really like to bake. I love to bake. Baking mm -hmm. is baking is a science, you know. Uh, <laughs> yes. For, for for myself and others out there who who want to maybe improve their baking skills or want to become amateur pastry chefs, can you give me maybe some hints and tips for wanting to improve their baking skills? Uh, yes, uh, Google on YouTube. <laughs> I'm sorry. Honestly, nowadays everything is so easy. Everybody can become super professional just by Googling. <laughs> I, it is really true. So, um, well, my tip is really there's so much good content out there on YouTube, on all kinds of channels. There's all those master classes about cooking and baking and so on. And um, especially now, I think it's a contemporary advice um, in the COVID times where we are stuck uh, probably with the Internet to have our social time and gain our knowledge. I recommend you do that. Follow, like, find your favorite pastry chefs, find them on Instagram, find them on wherever you want to find them. Follow them and then see what they offer and what, what kind of content they create. It's, it's really a good tip. But a practical tip, if you are into baking, there is a, there is a, there's like a, there's like a magic rule to baking. And that is you need three ingredients all the time. And that is salt, vanilla and lemon zest. And you put that into everything, and all your baked goods will be yum. <laughs> okay, I'll keep that in mind. Salt, vanilla, lemon zest. I like it. I like yes. it. I keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so you're saying that, uh, you know, you you were able to finally get your degree, but mm -hmm. started to steer courses. So I'm curious. Um, I guess as your time as a pastry chef, were you still pursuing dance at all or did that kind of get put on the back burner mm -hmm. um dancing kind of become became more while i was uh, in hamburg so it really had nothing to do with my with my degree but it was uh, a way of getting to know people so back then um with 16 i started with salsa and it didn't really continue until i moved to hamburg and in Hamburg, salsa was like my my drug. <laughs> it was uh, four days a week, party here, there, course, this, that, and so on. So it was very intense. And it was um, um, bringing me first friendships, kind of letting me get to know the city. And it was my workout. It was the thing that kept me sane uh, during uh, the zombie life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, tell me this then real quick. Um... You know, you said you started salsa when you were 16 and you picked it up again in mm. Hamburg. Tell me, do you remember what your beginner stage was like in salsa? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was the youngest in the whole course. Um, in all the parties, there was nobody of my age. It was very strange. I felt um, like the little duckling. <laughs> Um, and I think it was super exciting, but I felt kind of out of place because it was like the grown up world and I was the teenager trying to do something and super insecure about everything. I mean, as a teenager, you, you are most of the time insecure. You're trying to find yourself. So that's also why I didn't stick with it for too long. I think I was in, into salsa like one year and then. Every once in a while, I would go to an event, but not so much. So um, 
it took and it, it needed the time until Hamburg, which was then four or five years later. Um, I needed that time to like find my own motivation to be in salsa and not just you know learn a new dance and that's it. But I needed to find the personal motivation uh, why I want to be in salsa. And for me, it was the socializing part and the getting to know people. Yeah. I, I definitely understand that. Um, that's something that I agree with as well. You know, the social aspect, you know, meeting new people, being able to dance with them, making new friends, new connections, that is a great part of social dancing. So I definitely mm -hmm. understand that. Um, Do you dance salsa? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just like you, salsa was the first thing I started with. Mm -hmm. I just turned 29. And I probably started salsa classes when I was about 20 or 21. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it's, a, it's the age where lots of people enter into couple of dance free willingly. <laughs> Not by, you know, the force of your parents or something. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. That's so true. Um, so, so you're telling me, though, you finally get your, you know, your, I guess, degree as a, as a pastry chef. Um, but you want to switch tracks. So I'm curious, what happens after that for you? Oh, after that, um, I kind of partied for two years. <laughs> <laughs> no, so what happened is I, I was really exhausted. I was really um, not able to wake up uh, by sleeping less than seven hours. I would get very aggressive if somebody wakes me up. So I, I started really putting my, my physical needs first. Recovering my foot, I was very, very disabled from my foot. Um, couldn't walk proper, couldn't dance uh, proper anymore. I could not spin nothing. It, it, it was a healing process of two, three, four years. Um, yeah, because the last screws actually got taken out after two years, I think. Okay, um, real quick, real quick. I gotta. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, yeah. you, kind of, you kind of went over real quick, but what happened with your foot? I have to ask. Oh yeah, so the foot ankle broke in three places uh, in a bike accident. I just was distracted on my bicycle and I hit the light pole and <laughs> tripped, <laughs> um, dislocated and broke it. So um, really sexy. Mm, yeah, and this kind of um, disabled me from a lot of things and it made me realize, okay, I need to change my lifestyle. I need to change uh, no, taking care of my body, taking care of my sleeping time. Otherwise, I'll be continuing to be a zombie, and I didn't want that. So, yeah, it, and the bad side was that um, I couldn't do salsa anymore, as I did before. I couldn't do the whole dancing thing, and that was actually nearly my first thought. It was not, <laughs> it was like, oh, I'm missing my exams, and then it was like, oh, I cannot dance anymore. <laughs> It was like the two things really like tearing me apart while I was there in the accident, <laughs> not thinking about how do I get to the hospital? No, no. <laughs> um, yeah. So in the years after the degree, uh, after I finished the exams, um, uh, I started waitressing. I went back to, to waitressing in, in, bar, in, in a bar and in a restaurant. And it was very freeing because um, I worked, what, three days a week and I earned triple the amount of pastry chef and uh, had lots of free time. So I was like, hey, party. <laughs> um, and that went on for like two years and then um, I felt intellectually unsatisfied. So I really, really noticed that. Ah, Okay, you cannot do this forever. It's just a side job. Um, uh, I do like the whole service um, uh, area uh, professionally, um, and I think I'm 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 a good waiter and bartender. Uh, I have fun with that. But uh, I was like, okay, I need something for my brain. So I decided to go back to university, and this time I studied communication design, which is basically everything that has to do with uh, graphic design, but even beyond. So video, sound, art, editorial, photography, web design, and so on. It's all put into one, one university course. And I started that and uh, I have continued that for a few years, yeah. Okay, okay, that's amazing. Um, I guess I'm, I'm curious then, so you know, you start this up, I'm very curious, 
Uh, at what point or how are you introduced to Simba and Kizomba? Mm-hmm. That was right after the breaking of my foot. Oh. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I did something crazy uh, when I was 21. <laughs> I got married uh, to, a, <laughs> to a Brazilian. So the only important thing we need to know about that is that I learned Portuguese. <laughs> Nice. And the Portuguese yeah, actually brought me then to the Portuguese community, then the, the Brazilian community, the African community in Hamburg. And then when I um, interacting with the African community, I got to know, I got to see Kizomba. And I was like, okay, what is this? I don't understand. Whatever, how they dance it, I don't get it. And some guys tried to show me and tried to lead me in that. And I was like, it makes no sense. I've been dancing my whole life, but it makes no sense at all. It was not symmetrical. Like, you know, in salsa, you do the same to the front, like to the back and so on. And uh, you count in, uh, in four or eight, right? So Kizomba, as you know, it, you cannot put it into that shape uh, as in steps. Musically, sure, yes, music is counted always the same way, but dance-wise, not. Uh, so it was very difficult, and I was like, okay, I need to get this. I need to understand it. And then mm, it was a, it was a very good thing that I discovered it because because of the character of Kizomba, um, my foot was not disabling me anymore. Uh, it was actually the perfect dance to to get me back into dancing with the stupid foot that I had. So it kind of gave me some sanity also. <laughs> okay, okay. So I got I to gotta ask you this then. Um, tell me about your beginner stage in Kizomba then. I, I must know about that. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it took a long time. <laughs> took a long time. Um, back then there was really nothing for the German community for Kizomba. So the things that were happening were inside the Palop community. So that was very exclusive. So as a, as a white person, as a German person, you would not really enter there. Um, so getting to know the dance was a difficult task, but there was somebody in Hamburg from the salsa community that started organizing first workshops and started teaching everybody who could possibly be interested. So I got to learn some steps there. And then um, what happened next was traveling. But that was 2010. 2010, if you think about it, Facebook was not so present. Facebook was not really the place for events. Uh, you could not find really all the information on there about all your interests. What you still have to do is Google, but then you had zero information about um, is it a good event? How many people are there? Is it shit? Is it no? Who are the teachers? Imagine you 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 do, you choose a topic, you have no idea whatsoever about the topic, and then you need to make decision and spend like five hundred, six hundred euro for a weekend to go there and do this. So. <laughs> It was a bit insane, <laughs> but um, I was very, very much motivated to go through this. So uh, I kind of worked a lot, um, then tried to find a weekend off, spent all the money that I worked on that weekend in order to go somewhere pretty much alone. I, I remember my first festival was in um, Belgium. That was actually with a few people from Hamburg. But then the second one was alone in France, not speaking French, alone in Poland, not speaking Polish. <laughs> it was just for the love of dance. <laughs> the dedication, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, how, how did you get to know your first steps? Um, as far as salsa or kizomba? It's kizomba. Kizomba. Um, I'm pretty sure I first saw it at a social. Mm. I enjoyed it, but where I'm from, Richmond, Virginia, there were no teachers. So I actually had to drive an hour and a half to take a private lesson. Oh, man. <laughs> so it was also not the easiest. And, no, it wasn't. But I, that's how much I enjoyed it. I would go up every Sunday. I would wake up early in the morning, drive an hour and a half, take the hour so hour private, mm -hmm. and then drive back. But I love that. Oh, man. I love it. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, so you know, you know the dedication of dancers that we 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 used to put in so much um, energy, time, and money just to have like a little dance fix. <laughs> yeah. So mm-hmm. who was? Here? My first teacher, I actually was able to interview her. Her name was um, Tanya, Tanya Fisk. She goes by yes. Keanu. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, you know I know. Uh, I think I met her once, but I, kn- I knew her a lot from social media. Okay, yeah. Um, that was my instructor. Yeah, yeah. She, she travels as well. She's, um, she's a really big fan of Pechu. Have you heard of Pechu? Mm-hmm. Yeah, of she, course. Okay, well, yeah, she, she's trained at Pechu. Um, yeah, so that was my... I was blessed enough to have her within driving distance. So that was my first Kizomba and Simba instructor. Nice. Very mm-hmm. nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I've been uh, watching the the US scene develop uh, from okay. the start. Yeah, uh, okay. it was kind of I had a lot lots of contacts um, from the US, and when you guys started traveling to learn, and then teachers came over like um, at events, Lucia and so on. Like there were lots of lots of faces that were popping up in the states. Um, yeah, there's lots of stuff that reached me through social media until the moment that I actually also got to travel to the States and teach there. Yeah. Real quick, so I've had Eddie Vince on the show, and I've also had uh, Lucia Noguet on the show. Both of them are amazing. Um, nice. Super, <laughs> super amazing. Um, yeah. let, me, let me ask you this real quick. I'm very curious to hear from you. Uh, can you put into words... What draws you to Kizumba? You know, why do you like Kizumba so much? Can you put that in the words? Um, yes, let me try. <laughs> um, what got me hooked with Kizomba was um, the unpredictableness of the steps. That was the first motivation that I had. I was like, I, I'm not getting it. And um, which also means... Now, later on, I do understand the creative freedom that you have with Kizomba, which I find is a little bit more than with other couple dances. Um, then it was the music. Then it was the fact that you, you can dance so close in couple, but also respectful. So you're kind of in a hug, and hugging is something very therapeutic, right? So hugging is something that german people just they don't do you know like they 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 don't kiss nothing it's like hello my name is and you shake hands and and that's it so the for, the further you go north yeah the less body contact there is so um north europe no contact <laughs> no that's not true but um um the, 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 uh? i said covid is making like that definitely Oh, yeah, I'm completely, I changed my behavior already and I'm not even thinking about it anymore. It's terrible. <laughs> but yeah, so the, this like hugging sentiment that you have and the synchronization and the, the, the becoming one part in the couple dance on a, on a not highly energetic level, but like on a very smooth level of energy and, and nonverbal uh, communication. I love that so much. Um, that really got me hooked. And then uh, with time and discovering more and more about the dance, it, it just, everything, like the, the history, the cultural background, it really fascinates me. It, it really, I, I love it. I, I, the, the possibilities you have with the dance, the expression, the attitude, how, how men can express themselves, how ladies can express themselves. Like, you know, it's always with a little bit of elegance and you're kind of like, you, you, you're cool, but then there's like, bah, 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 footwork and you're like, yay. <laughs> uh, I just love it. I just, I just really love it. No, I understand that. I definitely understand that. I, I 100% agree with that, definitely. <laughs> um, so I, I dance salsa, I dance bachata, I do kizomba, simba, as well as some Brazilian zouk. Did your husband, previous husband, t- show you any zouk? Any Brazilian zouk? Any, uh, nope. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I, uh, he was a pagodji player, so he was playing the cavaquinho, which is the mini guitar. And he was uh, having his own band, so I learned samba. That was the thing to learn. <laughs> okay, amazing, amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, tell me this real quick. Uh, I want to get into 
you know, I guess your teaching career or teaching path. But I'm very curious to hear from you real quick. Um, tell me, what are some lessons that you learn from dancing that you're able to translate to your everyday life? Good question. Um, trust your gut. You really need to trust your gut. And this is something um, I've been, I mean, this is, I've been in situations again and again in the dance context where I had a stomach feeling, but I ignored it. So the after effects were coming, whatever it was, like making a wrong decision about going to a festival or making a wrong professional decision or whatever it is, or like trusting certain people um, and I should not. And, you know, like whatever you can do uh, wrong. <laughs> so this is something I really learned in the time of my dancing um then also it's important to be yourself it's important to stay authentic it really is otherwise you're just one of the other white sheep in the herd of a lot of white sheep and uh, yeah that's it so i actually i tried to adapt i did all the acting i did all the very diplomatic, hey, yeah, <laughs> so nice to meet you, da, da, da. but in the end, I'm like, no, no, it's not me, I don't want to be an actress, I want to be a dancer, and yes, I understand um, the political and the diplomatical society behavior that you have to put up, but in the end, let's be authentic, let's be ourselves, and don't do things just because you want to have 20,000 followers on Instagram, you know, it's just be yourself. There is a crowd for everybody and sometimes the crowd is bigger and sometimes the crowd is not so big. And it doesn't matter because as a teacher, as a dancer in the scene, what is important is your personal goal, of course. Okay. If your personal goal is, hey, I want to have one million followers, go ahead. <laughs> Do. But, but for me, I, I realize it every year again. I'm not here to become famous. I'm here to build a community to transfer knowledge as respectful and authentic as I can to have fun with the with the dance to be creative with the dance and um, to do something not just for me but for everybody around and yeah that be authentic <laughs> just do it that's yeah important. that's super important authenticity is very very important super important yeah um, and you kind of spoke on it, you know, that's what, that's what separates you from everybody else is when you're authentic. That's yeah. What out. So I definitely understand that. Yeah. Yeah. What, wanna... What's your favorite dance, actually? You said you dance several dance styles. So what's your favorite? Oh, Kizomba, easily. Nice. What yeah. keeps you in Kizomba? What keeps me with it? Hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I really, I thoroughly enjoy dancing it. Uh, and I think what keeps me with it is when, I don't think there's like any better feeling than when you see someone who's really good at their craft, mm -hmm. no matter what that is. So when you see someone who's really good, it kind of inspires you to be like, damn, you know, I can, I, I can get to that level. Right. Mm -hmm. So. So I guess um, seeing amazing dancers is that and me enjoying it. That's kind of what keeps me going, keeps me drive, keeps my drive, yeah? Mm, nice. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Good, good, yeah. Uh, let me ask you this real quick. Um, you know, we already spoke on, you know, you are a teacher as well. Uh, I'm very curious to hear from you um, because something that I often hear is that not every dancer is a great instructor and not every instructor you know equals a great dancer so i'm very curious to hear from you tell me about your beginner stage in teaching and learning how to teach what was that like for you <laughs> disastrous <laughs> absolutely disastrous okay so um when i started teaching it was basically because of a need what happened here is i got to know kizomba I was unsatisfied, unsatisfied about the offers that were here in Hamburg. 
So I started organizing as well. But you need to have students, you need to have participants. So I started organizing, I had a great uh, teacher invited and we had 16 people for an event that should have had 30, 50, I don't know, to cover. Anyway, so that's how it started, pretty chaotic. And then um, there were two people that were pushing me to actually start teaching because it's very simple. They're like, Maria, you need to create students and interests so you can continue organizing. I was like, okay, makes sense, whatever, I don't know anything. So I started teaching, very chaotic, very nervous because until Kizomba, I was not the person to be on stage, but I really loved the backstage because I would black out and red tomato face and everything, you know. <laughs> so I was like, ah, crisis. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and then half a year later, um, uh, I was recommend. So one of my first teachers was Joao Rocha. I don't know if you have come across him. He's the organizer uh, with Giedre, uh, Joao and Giedre are the organizers of Like Festival. I've had him on the show. Oh, you did? Oh, there you go. <laughs> I like that guy. Yes, yes, yes. So he was one of my first teachers and he kind of forced me <laughs> to attend uh, Pechu's teacher training. So uh, that was 2012, I think. Um, I got all my money together, all my bags packed, and I went two weeks to Lisbon and um, did the teacher course by Pechu and Vanessa, uh, did the like festival, and then did one more week of dancing, and that's the, how, when the whole craze actually started. Nicely, at the same time, I got to know, accidentally, my back then future dance partner on the salsa scene. Arnold and uh, when I came back from Portugal I started teaching with a proper sense I knew now what I wanted to do I knew how I wanted to approach it because that teacher training gave me really all the material um, that I needed to 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 find a way and also the confidence which was lacking a lot and at the same time I started to convince Arnold to come to classes it was like come dude you know learn some kizomba and Let's dance, let's train, and then it kind of all exploded. So in like, I think half a year to nine months, um, uh, we managed to get so much attention and we managed to get a little community together that uh, also Arnold and me started teaching outside of Hamburg. And that's when everything started. <laughs> that's amazing. That's amazing. Um... I want to ask you this real quick in regards to teaching. Um, can you give me any advice for any aspiring teachers out there? Any people, you know, who want to get in teaching, whether it be for dancing or, you know, uh, chess, or just any anything, any hobby of theirs, any advice for future teachers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, go to as many teachers as possible. Uh, go and talk and dance with as many people as you can and the ones that inspire you. Don't be afraid, you know, to get in contact. Um, train, 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 train. <laughs> what shall I say? But not, you know, not. it's not only about dancing. You need to train your, your knowledge as well. You need to get to know about the history, about the culture, about the background. You should have conversations with people from that culture to um, hear about their experience. And I mean, not just don't just go to the Angolans, go to the Cap Verdeans, go to Guinea-Bissau, go to Mozambique. Whoever is involved, whoever is sharing the the Kizomba Palop culture, yeah. So I mean, you, you know, we know in Cap Verde it's called Pasada in Guinea-Bissau and so on. Everywhere it's a little bit different, but I think. Um, widening the the picture um, um, more than just about Angola will help you to understand all the influences that have been uh, shaping what we're doing today and especially in Europe um, lots of um, changing of the dance and lots of development has been happening so that is not only just because of the Angolan roots but this is also because for example, Cap Verde music it was a big thing. And I mean, Getrezuk 
we own we own it to the Cabo Verdeans. So um, yeah, having that theoretical and uh, knowledge will help you to practically execute um, better and to understand what you're doing. So if you are if you're more into fusion, if you're more into urban and so on, I still recommend you learn the roots. <laughs> Learn the roots. <laughs> it's so uh, important and it will enable you to become an even better dancer. And it will make physically and theoretical sense at, to you as a dancer uh, when you're going into the fusion styles. So, um, yeah, that's all I can say. Like, And even if you are already a teacher, if you're already a professional you need to continue learning. Like for me, example, this year is the worst because I'm not in contact. I cannot go to festivals. I do not get inspired. I'm missing a lot of input. You know, I cannot, uh, I'm, I'm stuck. I feel like this year has been a catastrophe because my source of training, my source of inspiration, my source of further education is limited to the internet. And I'm sorry, yes, internet is great, but you need to do the physical thing also you need to dance with lots of people and we need it <laughs> no matter what stage of the of of dancer you are in definitely <laughs> you um you said a numerous things that are very very true um going back to you know even even instructors still need to be training super duper true so very true um you know, always be learning. That is super important. That is super. Mm. Um, and as well as the limitations of what, um, you know, the internet can teach you. YouTube, Instagram can only teach you but so much. So I, yeah. I definitely, I definitely understand that. Um, let me, let me ask you this real quick. You kind of, you kind of spoke on it. Um, tell me, why is it important so to to know the culture of a dance, like the, the back, the history of it, you know, why is that important? Um, I do think it's super important. First of all, you let's say I'm I'm outside of the culture. I'm not part of the Palop culture. So I'm coming as a stranger into something that I can understand only to a very limited amount if I only learn the steps, right? But uh, in order to understand the depth of a step and the, the, the possibilities of a step, I need to know where it comes from, why it is, how it is, and so on. So that is a very technical approach. But um, emotional approach and intellectual approach is I want to know where something comes from. So here we go. Let's go and search how, when did it start, who developed it, who... Where is the music coming from? Why is this happening? And always ask the question, why, why, why? Why, who, and <laughs> why? That's all. Um, because, I mean, you know, you, you're eating an apple, okay? You're happy about the apple. You go to the store, you buy the apple. Don't tell me you never thought about where the apple comes from. <laughs> you know, it's the same with dance. Don't just go to the dance school, learn a dance, and go home and don't think about it. I mean, that will make you just the consumer. But um, if, you are, if you are working with a dance, I think you, are obli you have to, you have the, you're obliged to do that kind of research to know where is it coming from and why is it there. And especially when it, when it has a culture behind it, when it's not just, you know, technically created. Like, I mean... Okay, I'm not, I don't want to bash, but Urban Kiss has been technically created, has been artificially created, okay? So I cannot really say that Urban Kiss has a culture. It doesn't have the story of Kizomba, for example, yeah? It doesn't, it, it was not born because out of the political, the, 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 the societal situation, how it was. It was not born out of the same music context and so on. Urban Kiss doesn't even have a music. I mean, they dance on everything. So, um... When there is a culture behind, you have to do the re research. You really have to. That, that's super, super true. And I definitely agree with that. I want to try and give some advice for dancers out there. So these next couple of questions are going to be kind of like just advice for dancers, all right? Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So um, 
for someone who feel who's a beginner, for a beginner who feels like they're stuck in this rut, like they're not getting better, oh, what yeah. <laughs> what words of advice, what wisdom could you give that person? Um, from my experience as a teacher, I do love beginners, um, absolutely. Um, and I think in my experience, most of them get stuck because they're searching for steps and steps and steps and they want to dance, but they are not considering the internal work that they have to do. So in the next step, after you learn the frame of a dance, which is technique, steps, how to communicate with your partner, good leading following, body movement, yeah? Uh, the next step is expand your body movement, sure, become really good on that, expand your footwork, um, but also expand your knowledge about the dance, so the, the background and the history and so on, it, it happens right there from the beginning. And then you have to start reflecting yourself. You have to work by yourself. Yeah, consider standing in front of the mirror and watching yourself dance alone. Dance alone with yourself. See if you like it. Can you watch your own video? Yeah, T uh, tape yourself and like see what you see. And is it looking like the idol that you have in your head? Um, you have to stop looking for the input from outside. You have to start looking for the input from in within you. Okay, mm -hmm. your issues. You have to look at your issues. Don't blame your dance partner. Don't blame the teacher. You know, like, look at yourself. Like, what, what's going on? Why am I not de developing? And probably the teacher will tell you, like, oh, you have to train on your body movement. And they're like, yeah, I'm doing the movement. No, but you didn't get it. <laughs> you know, you, you haven't fully grasped it. <laughs> and there's lots of ladies, actually. They're like, when they're reaching, let's say, uh, improver level, yeah? So shortly after beginner they're like yeah mm -hmm. they start to complain they're like uh oh, the guy is not dancing so well mm, there's not enough good leaders here blah 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 and the party was shit and you know <laughs> i bet you, you i bet you heard that <laughs> um and i'm like mm -hmm, okay let's look at you <laughs> <laughs> let's look at you and you can improve this 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 that but you need to do it without a partner <laughs> you know <laughs> it's not the partner if you think you cannot dance with anybody because there's just beginners yeah try following a beginner you cannot because you're not a great follower yet <laughs> you know um yeah it's it's always like you no know, check on yourself check on yourself when the outside information is is not satisfying to you anymore Try to find the problems within you and within your own dancing and then work them out. And when you figured something out or you don't, go to a teacher, ask, like, what do you think I can, what do you think is my specific problem? What do you think I can improve? And you will find something. Absolutely. 100% sure. You, uh, you said one thing that I've heard and I think is very powerful, and that is to record yourself dancing. I think that is uh, oh. a powerful tool. <laughs> To find yeah. things that you don't like or things to critique and fix. Oh, yeah. And a very painful process. <laughs> <laughs> it it Have you be. done it already? <laughs> um, I, Only a little bit. I Honestly, only a little bit. But um, when I did do it, I was a little bit ashamed. <laughs> uh, see? I was the same. I could not be in a room with a camera alone. I could not. I, like, the camera was so intimidating. I was like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> um, let me ask you this real quick. Um, you know, you kind of spoke on it for follows. Uh, tell me one, what is Jenga? And two, how does one improve their Jenga? Or mm -hmm. Jenga, however you pronounce it. Yeah, Jenga, yeah. Um, Jenga is the Angolan uh, word for body movement. Um, it is also coming with a little history. Uh, so there was an Angolan queen called N Njinga. Um, and she, her way of movement was is supposedly bringing the name to the movement in Kizomba. All right. So body, it's the body movement of men and women. Not only women, but at the moment in the last few years, it's more associated with the female body movement. 
So it's all about how the hips move, how the body moves or not moves, where it moves, what you do with your arms, what you do with your attitude, um, how you express your footwork, uh, all those kind of things. So in order to improve that, it's really going back to what I said earlier, uh, you need to start working with yourself. Yeah, I think it's it's something that starts by yourself alone. Uh, understand the movements, train the movements, um, loop them, repeat them. You know, ten thousand times. Um, try it on different musics. Go from Tarashina Kizomba Gedezuk to Samba to carnival dances. And one of the most important things that I felt like uh, was helping to improve. Um, body movement in Kizoma and Samba is actually tribal dances. So tribal dances, Afro house and Kuduro. All those all those dances, solo dances that really have a strong African um, root. Um, and you can see it in every single movement and that like grounding, the, the, this like grounding dances that really bring you to the floor into your knees and um, start teaching all the separation of your body you move your chest you move your hands or you don't move in an afro house mostly they're very still yeah they're, your, your hip and your, your feet are going crazy and the arms are pretty still and, and tight so all this can help you to really understand the root movement of kizomba and samba and uh, that's that's my big advice <laughs> go there do tribal <laughs> perfect 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 uh, tell me this, for someone who is an intermediate dancer, mm-hmm. want to get to that advanced level, what does it take for them? Ah, the same. The same. Um, but what I, what I advise very much is watching out for your pride. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, I, you know, I don't need to go to a workshop anymore. I'm too good for that. Blah, blah. Uh-uh. Mm-mm. Go to the workshop. And then if you're bored by the step for something else, I don't know, listen to how the teacher is talking or learn the other role. I mean, if you're, if you're a leader, go try to be a follower and the other way around. Um, or I don't know, there's lots of little things that you can focus on. Uh, take that class. If the step is very unexciting, take that class. And while you're doing the step and the routines, work on your footwork. I mean, try. And then you're going to make your partner super happy when she's realizing, who this dude is so much better than the rest of the class. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, Don't forget, like, you're, 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 you're with people. You're not dancing by yourself. So you're always going to affect who's around you, and especially while you're in a couple position. Yeah. So if you're having bad mood, if you're, if you're uninspired, the other person will probably feel it because I'm sorry. Ladies, we are feeling what you're thinking when we're in couple position. <laughs> Your body expresses it directly, right? So yeah, it's 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 just the same. Like reflect on your own own work, Re- reflect on your own level, uh, and refocus your brain so that you can continue learning. Ah, I, I completely agree with that. You you spoke on something, and you kind of leads me into my next question. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you teach both how to lead and follow is that correct mm-hmm. yes hey so um you know I, that lets you know automatically that you are an amazing dancer right there Aww. <laughs> <laughs> thank you that's so cute <laughs> but, i mean but, but uh tell me this though um you know why why is it important or why is it beneficial to learn both roles to 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 lead and to follow why is that helpful mm-hmm. um yeah, you don't have to, but I think it's beneficial. Yeah, so you're right about that. Um, in order to respect the other side a little bit more. Yeah, it's like, oh, the guys, uh, they only have to lead. Oh, the ladies only have to follow. Uh-uh. <laughs> you know? It's always always this kind of sentiment um, at a certain level. Um, first of all, to respect the other side a bit more, to understand the other side. And it's super beneficial to know the other side in order to um, improve your own movement. I mean, if you know how it feels to lead yeah, and how difficult it is, it is to lead, 
you as a lady, as a follower, will automatically relax a little bit more and you will stop complaining a little bit. Uh, yeah. So, and the other way around, when a, when a guy starts to follow, he might be starting to understand, oh, but I need a pressure at this moment on this part of my body in order to go this and that way. So when he goes back to leading, he has the information because he can imagine No, not, not imagine anymore, but he knows what has to happen. Yeah, so all the imagination that we uh, were having about the other role now turns into knowledge. So it can help you to improve your original side again, your original role. And that's why I think it's very beneficial, yeah. Yes, of course. Um, that is spot on. I, I think about, um, you know, going back to salsa mm. and, and, and myself, you know, trying to learn how to follow and I, it made me realize um when a lead was giving me like mixed signals or wasn't mm -hmm. you know i was unsure what to do you know it taught me you know you really want to give clear signals mm -hmm. and, uh unsure of yourself so i definitely understand that and i agree with it 100 yeah yeah mm -hmm. oh in salsa you tried it in salsa uh, i mean salsa keeps on but definitely yes i has I, so I'm lead. I'm obviously lead. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how you follow. I don't know how anybody follows. I don't know how you. Do that. <laughs> It starts with a hand up. Let me let me ask you this real quick. Um, when I say the word musicality, what does that mean to you? Mm -hmm. Musicality to me means that. Uh, You're listening, understanding the music, and you're expressing it physically uh, through your dancing. That's what musicality means. And I do think it is super, super, 100% essential and important, and it will distinguish you from any regular dancer to be a great dancer. I mean, you, you are a great dancer, no matter if you're a beginner or not. If you're executing what you know creatively and in sync with the music. Okay. Um, and, and so let me ask you the follow-up question to that then. Uh, how improve the musicality? Yeah, <laughs> million ways. <laughs> I mean, the, the easiest tip is uh, start listening to music nonstop. Uh, and not only kizomba, yeah. Go to go to the music that has been before. Go to the music that has been developing same time. Go to um, everything that influenced the the music category that you want to get to know. Uh, in if we're talking about kizomba, it's going to be everything samba, um, uh, <laughs> zouk, compa, um, afro house. Um, tribal uh, dances that bring the tribal music, then carnival music, ribita, everything. Go to Cap Verde, listen to Coladera, listen to everything. Uh, go to Guinea Bissau, listen to uh, all kinds of Afro Zouk and so on. Or any kind of any kind of music, any kind of music that slightly would touch the the focus point that you have. Um, And it may sound very strange to you in the, in the first years, um, depending on how fast you develop your, your understanding of the music. But um, just, you know, normalizing the music to your ear uh, will help you to predict and to understand physically also. Yeah, maybe mentally you cannot put it into words. Uh, so you have the body knowledge and you have the active, like, consciousness. Um, but just by manipulating your brain into hearing this music again and then again and again, it can help you a lot. And then, of course, you can do different approaches. You can start analyzing the music. You can start understanding the instruments that are involved. Um, do your research about, okay, this instrument was created there and then, and it does this and that, and it's mostly used, used in this and that culture or that and that context. So you can go very analytical about musicality also. And there's lots of classes out there, workshops. And, and also right now, lots of um, Zoom classes um, that will help you uh, to do a very analytical um, uh, understanding of a song.
for example, yeah? And what you then don't <laughs> have to forget is your theoretical knowledge is super important, but then try to apply it. Try to make sense of it in your, with your body and with your dance steps. Right. So if you are in a, in a theoretical class, don't be shy to ask, like, OK, can you show me this practically? Like you're talking about, I don't know, let's say the conga. Show me how the conga, how I could do the conga in my like accentuate the conga in my dancing. Yeah, this is uh, very important. Uh, like you said, you know, there are a plethora of ways. I definitely understand that. Mm -hmm. um, let me let me ask you my final question. Uh, last question I want to ask you. Can you give me one tip that can make anyone a better dancer immediately? Ooh. <laughs> mm. Immediately. Practically, yeah? <laughs> um. Have fun. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> have fun. It doesn't matter what you dance, how you dance it. It really doesn't matter. But your dance will always be better if you're smiling, if you're having fun, if you're sharing that energy with your partner. Always. Solo, partner dance, whatever. It doesn't matter. If you're dancing like this, yeah, you will have, okay, you're dancing, but is it cool? Is it nice? No. But if you dance like this, ha, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Everybody will be like, oh, she's having fun. Oh, she's a great dancer. Oh, da, da, da. Ah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it, your, your face, your, your smile will change everything. <laughs> Definitely. Um. I probably interviewed, I, I don't know, I'll say maybe close to 200 people. I don't think that's an exaggeration. And I believe you're probably the second person to say half fun. I think that's my favorite answer. Really? Yeah, I <laughs> asked everybody that. And everyone has different, a different answer, but I think that's my favorite oh. answer. Right? Yeah, that's oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so at this point, Miss Maria, um, you know, I really want to thank you so much, you know, for taking time out to talk to me. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Oh, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Hey, hey, hey. Um, so tell me this there real quick. I guess I have a couple more questions for you. But tell me this real quick. Um, do you have any upcoming events, anything that you want to plug or share with the people? Well, not really events, but uh, I would love to give an update on what's happening here. Um, so I've been part, I've been Tulu Kizomba for the last nine years, and this year finally, um, Tulu Kizomba has been fusioning with two more dance schools, Echevre and Salsa Division. They are Cuban salsa schools, and we're creating a huge as dance school in Hamburg. We have 600 square meter, five dance rooms. And we're completely blocked because of COVID, but whatever. <laughs> Renovations are going on every day, very strong. And um, we're fusioning together and we're a team of young people all in about the same age group. And we're very, very, very motivated to make this a big thing happening. So we started with live streams. We have lots of classes going on, on, on the Internet. Um, everything from salsa, rumba, Afro-Cuban to my Kizomba part, um, high heels uh, workshop we had. So watch us on abailarhamburg.de and um, that's the biggest project event I can talk about. <laughs> yeah. That's perfect. That's perfect. Um, real quick, tell me this. How can people reach out to you? How can they get in contact with you? Yes. You can follow me on Facebook or Instagram, Maria Maluka. For everybody, that's not my real name. <laughs> that's my artist name. People started calling me the crazy one, and that's what Maluka means. Um, <laughs> find me on Facebook. Find, find me on Instagram. Um, find me through my website, which is uh, tudukizoma.de or abailar hamburgde Write me if you have any question, if you have any desires, just reach out. I'll be hopefully answering. <laughs> hey, hey, perfect, 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 perfect. Um, 
I got to say, Maria, I thank you so much. Um, do you have any last words you want to share with the people before we close this episode with Two Left Feet Podcast? Uh, stay healthy, people. <laughs> Stay healthy mentally, especially. Okay, don't don't give up. Uh, remember to hug people whenever it's allowed again, <laughs> because hugging is healing. Okay, um, no, 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 no. That's it. <laughs> no more last words. <laughs> Just be all good. <laughs> perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, like I said, Maria, I thoroughly enjoyed this episode. I want to thank you again. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for reaching out. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I think that would do it for this episode of the Two Lefty Podcast. Thank you so much, Maria. Thanks. Thank you. Take it easy. Yay! (laughs) You too.